Okay, I think I've tagged Melissa. We're gonna do part two now. Um, how she found love after sexual assault and w sort of how she is healed and why she decided to talk about this and write this book. Get her on. Um, and then, oh, here she is. Okay. <laughs> Sorry okay. about that interruption. That's okay. I'm going to share your, oh, no, that's the wrong button. I almost reported you. <laughs> I did that accidentally to an author incubator video, and I tried to go back and figure out how to unreport it. <laughs> I, was like, no. I was trying to share it or something, and I hit. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I felt so bad. That's really okay, funny. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think right. we're business now. If not, looks good. Okay. Oh, so Marina's we... watching. Huh? You what? Marina, one of my Aww. friends from Rhode Island. Oh, everybody's watching. So, um, I have a lot of people come to me and say like say things like I know I'm never allowed to talk about sexual assault or that I'll get sued if I talk about sexual assault or like um almost there's like a idea that people will um it'll turn around from the other person being investigated for a crime and be like you're investigated for a crime what do you mean by that? Like, like almost the idea that reporting it. I, I mean, I think kind of like what what the counselor was saying. Oh, like, you mean reporting the crime? Okay, I thought you meant just talking about it in general. I gotcha. I'm following now. Yeah, yeah. That like reporting the crime will result in you being prosecuted for a crime or something like right. the crime of reporting sexual assault, which is very far from the truth. But then I think has a lot of silencing effect for people who experience this. So mm -hmm. I know you have a whole story of how you ended up coming to terms with what happened for you. Mm -hmm. um, right. And then you ended up like what ultimately made you decide to share your experience in a book and be more public about it. Mm hmm. So. I think for me, like, I really, it really was that if you do not see her, you have to be yeah. her. Okay. I looked around, like, I just wanted to see somebody that was open and real about what life looked like. Mm -hmm. And I rarely, if ever, saw her. And as the Me Too movement unfolded and people started also talking about sexual assault within that, I, I found a lot of people saying, okay, well, it happened to me in this location and I was this age. Or it happened, you know, not what life looked like after. Yeah. And the reality of what it's like to live life after being sexually assaulted. And for me, I wanted to know that there were other people crying on the kitchen floor. Not because I wanted them to be crying, but because I wanted to feel like I wasn't alone. Yeah. And I felt so alone. But I also made myself be alone because I wasn't sharing my story, right? So yes, I'm isolated and alone because nobody knows, but I'm like searching to see this person. And what if that person is me? What if she needs to be me, right? Yeah. So that's where I got to sharing my story. And then I love going to all different types of spiritual healers and all that fun stuff that people might sometimes call woo woo, but I tell you the woo woo saved my life. Yeah. So <laughs> after this whole, if you do not see her, you have to be her. I went on this journey to really figure out how am I going to be her and in what capacity can I do that? And all signs pointed to write. You have to write your book. And I've always, ever since I was a little girl knew that I was going to write a book. 
I had no clue. I thought maybe it'd be, I even have, this is actually funny that we talk about this. I wrote a book in school and it's right here sitting on my thing, but I always was writing stories and little books and poems. And I just knew that some, in some way, that's how my, the direction my life was going to go. Never did I think that it would be about the most like personal, intimate parts of my life. Yeah. Um, but so after all my woo woo and all the things that I love told me to write, it, I just knew it was time and the running and hiding from all of it that I tried to do, just like I tried to run and hide from the fact that I had been sexually assaulted. There was no more running and hiding. It was time. And so when you were sort of on your path to, um, and so when you have, when you talk about finding love after sexual assault, it's Mm -hmm. to me a big portion of what you're talking about was finding a loving relationship with yourself and your body again, and sort of reintegrating your Mm -hmm. spirit into your body and letting your body be a safe place for that is that absolutely you know I kind of like how I had to listen to that I needed to write a book there was this school in Rhode Island that just called my name I didn't know why I'd never been to Rhode Island but for some reason I knew that I needed to go there and study these holistic ways that I knew nothing about and I sold everything that I owned except for what would fit in my little two-door Honda Civic and drove across country uh, to the school. And when I got there, learning, I mean, simply put, Aristotle's the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? And so as I start looking and learning about the way that the mind works and the way that I think about things and learning to not see them as negative, but learning to love the thoughts as they are and know that they serve me a purpose kind of like keeping everything a secret and hiding it and trying to live two separate lives. My mind thought that that was the absolute best thing for me to do. Yeah. And it was fantastic. Okay. It wasn't fantastic, but it served the purpose that it needed to. Right. And I did to love that instead of being angry with myself for not being able to use my voice instead of being, you know, upset when I'm crying on the kitchen floor because I'm alone. I had to learn that, wow, this has served me a great purpose and it's got me here and it's got me to this school. And now what can I do to shift that perspective? What are some new things that I can bring into this? So something I see happen a lot, and and I've even felt like this in the past, is that you'll hear uh, people like us be like, just love yourself. Just go ahead. Mm -hmm. Just like love the hard parts of yourself. Like love the part of yourself that's crying on the kitchen floor. Love those, like you said, those strong legs that took you Mm -hmm. up to, you say in your book, those strong legs that took you up to the witness stand. Just like Mm -hmm. love them. And people are like, okay, but like how? Like, I hate myself. The advice that I always give, sorry, the advice that I always give to people is like, yeah, it is not easy and you have to like invest your time, invest your money, invest your energy into figuring this out for yourself. Like it's not supposed to be like, oh, just, just do that. Right. Like, what do you think about it? I I agree with that. I also, I start with kind of acknowledging, right? So for me, like there was no way that I was going to love that I had been sexually assaulted. There was no way that I was going to love crying on the kitchen floor. Yeah. And good for big legs, like no way that I was going to love them, right? But I learned that instead of just like being like, okay, now I love them. I had to acknowledge their existence. Right. Yeah. So I had even if it was like a simple like wave hello, like hey legs, I see you. I had to start with just seeing and noticing like you exist. I could love. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because I couldn't just love, I mean, for something that I tried to push away when you think about the sexual assault and the rape, like I write about it being like this cloud. Like I could not like I could not get the freaking thing away from me no matter how far I tried to run. And there was no way that I was just gonna like grab onto this cloud and hug it and love it. Like, absolutely not. And so I had to start with, okay, I see you, you know, you're here. 
and then go from there. And then eventually that acknowledgement grew to love, but there was absolutely no way to start with love. Yeah. I, I see a lot of people use it as another form of blaming themselves or blaming other victims. And I think you said something really um, amazing that I, I think is like so key in, in your book about how our external environment mirrors our internal environment. Oh and when we're internally rejecting part of our experience, that's how it happens. Like we get rejected on the outside. But then I think that that like people tend to misuse that concept and say, see, I'm doing another thing wrong or see, it really is the woman's fault that the sexual assault happened. She brought it on herself. And right. That it's such a subtle difference. Do you have mm -hmm. a, a way that you talk about that or do you ever see that as a problem? Give me an example of where it like, I, I mean, I actually get asked this question a lot because I mm -hmm. do thought work with people. I help people mm -hmm. acknowledge their experiences right. and decide how they want to feel. And sometimes that means feeling angry and you just choose deliberately. Mm -hmm. But knowing that your thoughts are what create your feelings, not the experience itself, not the sexual assault even. And mm -hmm. then when people hear that their thoughts create their feelings. I see what you're saying. Do you okay. know what I mean? And yeah, I totally it's get so it. It's different. It's not. It's totally different. Um, because there are still days, like I'll admit, there are still days that I get angry or that I get sad. And I and think even now. To, right? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and that's totally okay to be angry and sad. Yeah. But. I have to choose to love the anger and the sadness. Yeah. So I think it's not necessarily like the anger and the sadness. Mm -hmm. It's how I choose to respond to it, how I choose yeah. to nurture it. So if I'm angry and all of me just becomes angry and feels nasty, that's okay. As long as I know that I'm holding the space lovingly for me to be angry. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think it totally makes sense. And I think yeah. it's like such a meta concept that mm -hmm. I think it is something that is genuinely challenging to learn because anger sometimes feels terrible. We don't want to mm -hmm. feel negative feelings. And so it feels easier to blame somebody who has bad behavior for our negative feelings, but it's actually right. not easier. Yeah. Because then they're no. in charge. Yeah. Right. And and their negative feelings really have n nothing to do with my feelings. Yeah. If I let them, <laughs> right? If I choose to see that. Yeah. I think it's mm -hmm. I think it's a more difficult concept to master. I think it it's one of those things where once you've done it, you're like, oh, like Byron Katie talks about uh, you're walking down a dusty road and you see a snake in the road and you're afraid to keep going. And finally, you feel like you have to keep going and you realize the snake is a rope. And then you see other people coming forward and they're afraid of the snake. And you're like, you know, it's a rope, mm -hmm. but you like can't convey it until yeah. they see it. Yeah. I think it's, Isn't that interesting? I like that example. Yeah. I think it's one of those mm -hmm. things yeah. that is tough to, because I really understand how it, when people ask me if it's victim blaming to show people that their thoughts create their feelings, I kind of get it. I you do too. I mean? Mm hmm. Because I, I could totally see like if the state that I used to be in yeah. and how I used to be, if somebody were to tell me that my thoughts create my reality, then I would think, okay, well, then I created this mess, right? Like I, I asked for this somehow. I could see that. So there is that fine line of supporting people. And also acknowledging that, hmm, how do you support people through that? Because I haven't had that come up where it's been yeah. seen as blaming. So what I say is your feelings are never a problem. Like identifying mm -hmm. any of your feelings as the problem is self-blame. You mm. get to decide someone else's behavior is a problem. And that's a completely separate question than how you want to feel about it. 
Okay. And like, yeah. you get to feel angry or devastated or humiliated or discouraged or hopeless or whatever you want to feel mm -hmm. about the situation. But that's just always going to be a separate question than whether the other person committed a crime or the other person mm -hmm. like, did something wrong even. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. I think it's mm -hmm. interesting. So you have all these international experiences that were really helpful to you. Mm -hmm. You, you oh, know, cool. we were both in Tanzania. Um, I think were we there at the same time? I don't know. When were you there? I was there, I think I left the end of March through June. Of what, say year? 2009. Okay, so I was there December 2010, so just the year after. Oh. Each other. Did you not love it? Oh, I love it. Maybe we should go back. I know, 100%. Have you been yeah. to Zanzibar? No, I didn't go. That's where we gotta go. And on a oh. safari, I wanna go on a safari, so. Are we, we, did you go on a safari at all when you were there? Mm -hmm. Oh, that was incredible. We went to the Serengeti and then Gora Gora Crater. It was amazing. Yeah. And so say a little bit about the experience that you had. So you had an experience with a healer there who gave mm -hmm. you insight that at the time you were like, that's not real insight, right? <laughs> Right. Yeah. So I had this wonderful opportunity where two of my girlfriends and I went to meet with a spiritual healer and he had us walk around his garden. And as he walked, we walked around, he was explaining to us the different plants and why each one grew next to the other one and all of their magical powers, which I didn't retain any of it because I was like, where am I right now? I'm like on the mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro is over there. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I don't know what's happening. So anyway, he had us go and find a place in the garden that we were drawn to and take a seat. And then he would come and talk to us. And so I found this rock and I was looking out at Kilimanjaro. And the first thing he does is he starts drawing in the sand and then he starts talking about the direction I'm sitting and there's so many little things that go along with that. But the main takeaway for me, at least for the purpose that's in the book and for this conversation is he talked about how I'm like this flower and that all the bees are attracted to me and not talking about a flower like women are these fragile little flowers. Yeah. It wasn't anything like that because I, I'm not a fragile little flower. Yeah. Sorry. So here I am like this analogy of this flower and these honeybees coming in to steal my pollen. And I can't differentiate between the good and the bad. I just give, give, give. And so he was like, well, what are you going to do to change the color of your flower? I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't know. What am I going to do? Tell me. Nothing. I got so nothing. I think this is that example of the thing where you're, that I was talking about where we end up being like, oh, I'm doing another thing wrong. My right? aura is and wrong I, too. Yes. It's I totally did think that. that these it's bees. my fault. Something's wrong with my flower. Yeah. Where my flower <laughs> is. And I don't know <laughs> what to do. So I left that experience kind of like excited in a sense, but also really weirded out because yeah. I'd never met with a spiritual healer before. I didn't know what all of this was. Um, and so then I don't even think it was a year later, I ended up moving to Greece. Yeah. And I'm introducing myself to people and they laugh at me and I'm like, what the heck, why are they laughing? And it's because my name in Greek actually means honeybee. And so I was introducing myself as the honeybee. And one day I went for a hike and like the aha moment happened. And I was like, oh my gosh, here comes the spiritual healer, like back in my head from Tanzania and realizing that my name means honeybee. And I'm like, okay, maybe if this little honeybee learns to love herself, the color of her flower will change. It took me all the way from Tanzania <laughs> to Greece to learn that, huh, maybe I should learn to love myself. The trick. And then you have to do, then I think that's when the work starts, right? Because then yes. you have to be like, what does that even mean? Like, exactly. How do you love yourself when you hate yourself? Right. And I did. I remember telling my mom before I left for Greece that I felt like a body and like a spirit. Like I did not feel connected at all, yet I didn't understand the concept of body, mind, and spirit. Yeah. So I just 
felt so disconnected that I was able to articulate that piece. But yeah. beyond that, I couldn't articulate it any other way. It's so interesting because that that is a really common description of people who experience trauma. Like, I, I think you've probably done trauma research, but um, have you ever read the book Waking the Tiger? I think that's in this book. It might have been a Martha Beck book, though. No. Waking the Tiger. Um, Peter Levine. It's a really great book about trauma and trauma healing, mm -hmm. but... Um, one of the things somebody, I did, I did all this research at one point, so they're all mixing together. But, um, one of the things that somebody I read mentioned was that traditional shamanic healers, when they're dealing with trauma, the purpose is to reunite the spirit with the body because the spirit's been scared away. And it's such a common description of how people feel after trauma. I think it's really interesting. And that must be why I love shamanic journeying. Yeah. And you, I mean, you are not like, I don't, tr I don't see you as your background being very hippie or very like. Uh, so here's, here's the really funny thing is I grew up in a family who's very country. And as a child, I was always called the flower child because I was the and I loved like crystals and rocks and bugs. And I would go out and do these weird prayer dances and it would rain. Like I was totally like that. But I think that I felt the need to suppress it or to act like it wasn't there because it didn't fit the model that I was growing up in. And not, not to any fault of theirs. That's just who they were. But for me, the, I was always that. And it was like, as I started this Tanzanian spiritual healer really started my path kind of back to myself and back to mm -hmm. that stuff, because even as a little peanut, that, that was totally me. And I tried to run from it or hide mm -hmm. from it or something because I didn't want to think that these weird things were real. Yeah. I mean, and I think like, I mean, you're in a PhD program now, right? Like you've also, engaged in traditional education, traditional therapy, like, um, yeah. and then I think it's just interesting that we have such rigid lines about what's acceptable when we're mm -hmm. trying to solve a problem, right? And like, there's so many experiences where it's the whole mm -hmm. of what the world right. has to offer, not just the Western, not just the Eastern. Absolutely. And I'm actually finding that in my doctoral program, because when I studied holistic leadership, all of it was brought together. I mean, that was everything that we studied. And now it's more traditional mm -hmm. and less um, spiritual, less of all the things that I'm so used to having in my education that I'm actually struggling. Interesting. In a sense. Yeah, because that piece of, I mean, before every class in my master's, we would do a focusing exercise yeah. and we were all doing experiential activities to really connect us body mind and spirit using the creative and expressive arts and now I'm like sitting at a table listening to powerpoints uh, and not that I'm not learning a lot but I'm like when do I get to color when do I yeah. <laughs> I have my yarn here my yarn exactly oh. exactly <laughs> so it's cool is great but it's really a different process than what I was used to. <laughs> so what do you think now in your life after you learned all this and sort of have integrated these lessons um, from all the different healing modalities that you've used? Like, what do you think is, is are sort of the biggest changes that you see in your life now? Mm -hmm. I think so that piece that you talked about earlier where my external world really mirrored my internal world. I mean, the men that I was attracting into my life, not, not all of them, I wouldn't have been able to recognize a kind man if my life depended on it at the time. So this is not to say that every man that crossed my path was bad, because that's not the case. But those that I choose to love, those that I choose to really bring in intimately, treated me the way I felt. If I felt ugly, I was going to find somebody that made me feel like I wasn't good enough. If I felt fat, I was going to find somebody who made me feel like I wasn't thin enough. Um, I would find people who were mentally abusive because they confirmed exactly how I felt on the inside, that I wasn't good enough, that I would never be good enough, that I wasn't lovable. Um, 
So for me, that switch, now that I have this new perspective of myself and that I'm not running and hiding from that cloud of sexual assault, I'm yeah. owning it, owning it lovingly and owning those parts of me, the people that I attract into my life, not only in dating relationships, but also in friendships. It is the most magical, beautiful thing that I am finding relationships that mirror where I am now. And even some that, you know, when I'm going through hard days, I look at them and sometimes I'll revert back and be like, oh, like maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not. But then I realize what well, I have to snap out of it and realize, yes, I am good enough and meet that with love because it's such a drastic place from where I was to go from hiding everything, feeling so miserable and attracting people and relationships to make me feel that miserable to then being a place where I feel so loved and so supported and so on my path, even physically, my appearance looks different, which is so interesting. I weigh more now than I've weighed in other times in my life. And I feel like I look better. Yeah. Like I love my curves now. I love, you know, it's a really interesting shift to be like, wow, that scale says a whole heck of a lot more, but man, I like myself way better now. <laughs> yeah. That's so, amazing. So what do yeah. you think would be your number one piece of advice to somebody who's afraid to talk about? Well, I guess first, have you experienced horrible ramifications and ridicule and been burned at the stake for talking about your story? No, actually. I'm I thought, shocked. huh? Are I you said shocked? I'm shocked. <laughs> I think that um, because I have created such a safe space for myself, that that's mirrored in the people that are yeah. coming into my life. And so I guess there was one I found had my first internet troll on Facebook one day. That's so but it wasn't even kid. I, it was kind of fun. It was when I had these guys come from behind with a Nerf gun in the mall and shoot me and like then hide the gun in their sleeve. So I'm scared. I turn around and they're dressed in these black coats with guns or whatever up their sleeve telling me that my ass is too nice not to shoot, which is horrible. And so I had posted something about it on Facebook and I got told that I was pretentious and all of these other really great things. Oh, like as though you were bragging? No, they were like, it's a Nerf gun. Like, stop being so pretentious and have some fun or something ridiculous like that. The guys so, themselves posted? No, no oh, some other Facebook troll. I don't know who it was. <laughs> so, but beyond that, that is the only negative response I got. I even thought from my family that there would be negative responses because in my book, I mean, the last thing I wanted was for my dad to read about my sexual experiences, yeah. right? But I knew that if I wasn't open and transparent about that part, that I'm not being fully honest. I'm not being fully authentic. And that's not helping anybody because yeah. for me, I really did sexualize my body. And I, I attracted people because I'm like, oh, look at these curves. But then I would hate myself because I was attracting people that I didn't want because of my curves. And it was this whole vicious, ugly cycle where even sexually, I would be in, like, I would say yes to things because it was easier to say yes than say no. Because if I said yes, then they weren't raping me, right? Mm -hmm. Even if, if you said, don't want no. it. So we exactly. like, tolerate things that we don't want. To exactly. Yeah. Because the last thing I wanted was to go through what I had went through before. Yeah. And I knew that if I didn't openly talk about that, that it wasn't helping anybody. And my whole family after, well, the ones that have read it have met me with love. Even when I talk about having sex with people that I didn't want to have sex with, or even when I talk about their victim blaming towards me, I really thought that that was going to have a negative reaction and it was met with love. So. I think it's interesting what we notice and what we don't notice. Like I, I was very afraid to tell my story and of mm -hmm. ramifications, even in the legal community of talking about what happened to me. And my experience was that the people who didn't, who wouldn't like what I said, don't even notice that I'm talking about stuff. Right. And the people who support me are like super interested and care and mm -hmm. the people who have had similar experiences to me 
reach out because they know that right. and they're the ones that talking about all of this is really for I think mm -hmm. absolutely so what would you say to someone who's kind of afraid to talk about their story and kind of blaming themselves for some kind of trauma they experience? Mm -hmm. So first, like I totally understand why they would do that. I think that that's something that I was never met with was that understanding, like I get it. And that's so important is just to have somebody there to listen and say, I hear you and I get it, right? That whole mirroring thing. Um, now I forget where I was going with that. Well, one thought that I had is when you look at that experience of the troll saying that you're pretentious mm -hmm. compared to like being able to be that person who opens up this conversation and talks about it and potentially reaching someone who you could support like how do you think that weighs for you like do you feel like this oh my gosh like the, he means nothing yeah right the, the the women that I support and that I will continue to support mean everything to me yeah. because uh, I, I am them right and that I want them each to feel the healing that I have felt, right? Because it's such a beautiful thing to come out on the other side. And you think, you know, I said this when I was talking to Robert too, when you think about how hurt people hurt people yeah. and you look at the statistics of sexual violence, we have so many hurt people running around that it breaks my heart. And, and with no skills, I think, to resolve it. Mm -hmm. And to like, we're just not taught how to deal with it. And I think it, I think that a lot of times it's, I, I'm always even a little um, hesitant to talk about the wooey component of things because I think it makes it sound impossible or like magic when really it's just like things that you learn, like mm -hmm. skills that you learn, like we learn anything. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And I think for me talking about the wooey, like sometimes it does feel magical and I like that. I like magical. like the magic. <laughs> <laughs> it is magical, but then, I mean, I think feeling better and knowing that you've experienced trauma and knowing that you're grateful for trauma, even because it's brought you to a right. place of strength that you couldn't have gotten to otherwise, feels like magic, I think. Absolutely. Because we don't yeah. realize that it's possible or it seems like... I, I had one client um, a couple months ago say to me, uh, remember when you told me that I could be a leader in the business and I didn't believe you and I thought you were a crazy person and now I'm a leader in the business? <laughs> and I was like, I know, I never know how to like balance telling what people what actually is possible and like right. meeting them where they are, you know? Yeah, with that's them. hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you were saying that the advice you would give somebody is that you totally understand where they're coming from if they don't want to talk about it. Right. And I, I think listening, but listening doesn't always mean that they're talking. Right. So there's so many other ways to listen to somebody. There's just sitting and being. And then I also think for me, the creative and expressive arts were huge. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, and I would think this would be true for a lot of people, that there aren't, there isn't a large vocabulary on how to process trauma. There isn't a lot of words, right? And so for me, visual drawing is the best thing that could have came into my life because it gave me a way to communicate and to express things that I didn't know I could express. And I don't have to have the words, right? And so somebody that I'm working with or people who have worked with me in the past, as we're going through the process, bringing in other modalities of communication are huge because it's, it's hard. It's hard to talk about it, especially when you don't have the vocabulary or language around how to talk about it. I still don't know how to describe to you what it's like sitting on that kitchen floor. I can describe the tears. I can describe it as heavy. But beyond that, like, I don't know how to describe what's going on internally. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So I always think 
like one of the things that I always say to people is that there is like almost nothing that you can do wrong in how you process trauma. I mean, I think being violent to other people is maybe the one way that you can go wrong in processing trauma. Yeah. But otherwise, there's no, there's no wrong way and there's no like 100% right way. We're all different. And, you know, making sure that you have that toolbox of different modalities is key because not, there's not one right way. Yeah. So if people want to get in touch with you and talk to you more or tell you about their story or like get help from you, how can they do that? Yeah. So right now, if they just send me a personal message, so there's a lot of things that I'm, I feel like I'm good at and technology has not been one of them. I thought I had my landing page up and going so people yeah. could get a free book and I do not have my landing page up and going because I didn't quite figure it out. Like but I thought I did. But if they email so, you, can they get a they copy can, of your book? Absolutely. Or they can send me a message through Facebook, Instagram. Yeah. If they want a copy of my book, absolutely. I will send it their way. Okay, so tell people who are you, what's your handle on Instagram? So I'm at love period Melissa period Ann. And your email address is similar to that, right? What's your email? It's love Melissa Ann one okay. at Gmail. And I can post that in the comments. Okay, good. Yeah. Post yeah. in the comments how people can get a free copy. And I loved your book. I thought it was just oh, thank you. such a beautiful story. And I I am grateful to you because I talk to people every day who are really afraid to share their stories and mm -hmm my experience has so been so positive of sharing my stories. And like you said, you, you kind of don't even notice the people who are no. haters or trolls because they're having very hard feelings. Right. And it almost made me, at least the one that I've experienced so far, it almost made me kind of laugh. Like, really? Like, you think you like, can break me? Like that's your, yeah. I had someone ask me the other day, uh, what, or maybe I was trying to think of an example of something negative that had happened for somebody mm -hmm. and I had to sit for like five minutes and like really process in my brain like you're looking for somebody who hated your book like find somebody in your and then I was like oh I found one they said maybe you sent me the wrong book and I was like okay <laughs> okay okay yeah so okay Aww. so love Melissa Ann one and your book is called who will love me yes I'll post it all in the comments when we get off Okay, awesome. And I'm, you're doing your PhD program now, but are you at all taking clients or yes, meeting with people? I am taking okay. clients. And I'm in the process of revamping my program, so it's going to get even more fun. That's so <laughs> Which fun. I'm excited so, about. So you basically, it sounds like, work with women to go from that place of crying on the kitchen floor to go to the place where your external world and your internal world. Absolutely. Yes. Using that whole, you know, looking at our mind, body and spirit and how do we reconnect to those? Yeah. yeah I love that. Well, <sighs> you are so wonderful and thank you for talking Poor to people. me and I'm going to see you, I think in a couple weeks. Yes. I'm going to message you because We're my whole life been nuts. we'll figure out something, but yeah. I will see you. <laughs> One way or another. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.